The time has come. Execute episode 66. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Has the retro mother load just been discovered? Can you dig it? The unreleased Nintendo dev kit for the masses. Hail to Dr. King, baby. All this and more coming up on This Week in Retro. Up to date news for out of date tech. So, Chris, how do you think last week went? It, it was a good show in my mind. We, of course, had the addition of Dave on board with his charming Scottish accent and um, his great insights. Uh, Dave, very much into his RPGs and his multi-user dungeons, a world that I didn't really frequent. RPGs, yes, but I was never never a mudder. Were, were you, Chris? No. In fact, when you guys were mentioning mud last week, I've really had something else envisioned in my mind. Um, it's taken me all week to get those images out of my mind um, with Dave and mud. Uh, but yeah, not <laughs> something I was into. But in terms of having you on, on the show, that was that was fantastic. It really just felt like a... Uh, you know, three guys, three mates just hanging out at the pub and having a chat about back in the day. It was it was really good. Yeah, and some really nice feedback from the listeners who uh, seem to enjoy it on the whole. So um, thank you for that. And if you're happy, we're happy. We'll, we'll get Dave, we'll get other guests in once in a while just to mix things up and bring in those other insights. And if you've got any suggestions for guests, do let us know on the subreddit. Um, they don't have to be a, a, a famous YouTuber or, uh, you know, anyone from retro history, just an enthusiast who um, perhaps you know from the community, perhaps they've done a podcast before or do a bit of live streaming, or something like that, we'd be more than happy to have them on the show. Um, the more the merrier, I say, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was really good. Uh, with Dave, I could actually almost understand every word he said too, so that was that was good. <laughs> every um, other word. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, joking aside, I think it's great to have a fresh perspective as well. Um, I mean, yourself and myself, we're into our Amigas. We have a broader range than that as well. I know you're into PC gaming, um, same as myself. I've had a SNES, Jaguar back in the day, those kind of things. Um, but to have somebody else that not only had different systems, like the st whatever that is um but also enjoyed a different genre of gaming it really adds something so yeah, so yeah it's really we, good to have that we are guilty aren't we of getting a little bit amiga heavy sometimes and that's just because of our own experience and i know a lot of the listeners yeah. come from that background as well and uh, dave did very well because i know he is an ardent atari st supporter um <laughs> and there were a few things uh, uh there are a few games in the ST world that get heralded as brilliant Amiga games when, in fact, they started out on the ST, and it just kind of gets whitewashed. And I know that in particular winds Dave up. So mm. uh, maybe we'll have to get him on again if, if that topic comes up in conversation. Um, <laughs> and then just one other thing to say, um, there is a listener and uh, an, a, a submitter of news to the show uh, who I incorrectly said their name um, two oh. times. Last week, I called God. them Croak Croak. Carmen, I think I said. So I do apologize for getting your name wrong. Uh, it is, of course, Croc Kayan. So uh, we'll make sure we get that right moving forward. Should we go into our first story, Chris? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> our first story this week is submitted by Pajaco6502. And it's one of those um, stories that vintage collectors, not just of retro, but of anything really, will really love it's it's the fairy tale story the barn find the sealed container the forgotten warehouse stuffed full of the things that you love in a perfect time warp perfect condition unopened as good as the day it was born um and as you remember it in your memories when you went into the shop to look at, at that thing and that's exactly what we've got here it's been reported on games radar that hundreds of factory sealed games have been discovered in a warehouse in nebraska usa we're talking Super Nintendo, Mega Drive, Mega CD, Saturn, 3DO, and a hell of a lot more besides. They were all packed away in a plastic storage crate in 1994, only to be discovered now some, what's that, 26 years later, I think, Chris. Standout mm. titles, according to the article, include Sunset Riders, which is, now I'm taking this from the article, apparently valued at around £500 for Sunset Oof. Riders. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4, Turtles in Time, valued at around £1,000 in this condition. And um, th these prices, by the way, uh, from the article, they say they're based on recent eBay prices when they come up for sale, but few, if any, in this condition ever do come up for sale. <clears throat> hmm. 
Um, I'll tell you what won't be fetching super high prices from this haul, though. Uh, even in this condition, sports games, there are, of course, boxes and boxes of NFL, NBA, and golf games. They're all in there, too. Will the time ever come, I wonder? I, I mean, we've laughed so many times at the number of sports games. Whenever you go to a charity shop, whenever you go to a car boot sale here and you're looking for bargains, it's always the FIFAs, it's always the sports games. But will the time come when people have milked that joke so much that we've actually thrown them all away and they become rare? <laughs> do, you, do you think that time might come, Chris? Maybe in a thousand years? Uh yeah, it might do. Yeah, and about that. It's the same over here. Yep, charity shops, that's all you find. That and The Sims. Nobody wants The Sims. Oh, really? And all the expansion packs for The Sims, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also in this haul are the classics like Final Fantasy III and a big one, Chrono Trigger in mint condition. Um, you really need to watch the video to see it all. It's a bit kind of Blair Witchy, the way they filmed it just with a shaky hand cam um, as someone uh, clearly very excited takes us around with their phone to show us all of the things. And you have to kind of furiously pause. It's quite fun. You have to pause the video and see what you can pick out on the shelves and in the boxes. It's, it's a good fun video to watch. And hopefully we'll get more of a tour when the excitement has died down and they've set up their tripods and they can take us through it all. Um, I should mention the video is on the channel. This is Game Room, all one word. This is Game Room over on YouTube. Oh, okay. Um, I actually have very fond memories of playing NBA Jam. <laughs> I know it's a sports game, but it was at a stag party and I was playing, it was on an arcade cab and I was playing against a... Um, Oh, no, why? I can't actually tell you that story. It's not appropriate. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, back to the video. Um, who are these guys, Neil, and, and where did they find this hall? God, first Dave in mud, and now whatever whatever you were up to with your NBA jam. I don't want to know, Chris. I don't want to know. We're finding <laughs> out too much about your sordid past. Um, so uh, this channel, uh, it, it's only got about four videos on it. One of them, though, um, I dug a little deeper. One of them is based in a warehouse, which is full of games by the looks of it. They're given very little away about this particular hall. But if you look at the videos and you look at the warehouse, you can see it's floor to ceiling games, DVDs, Blu-rays. And they comment um, in the sec below the video in the comment section. Someone mentions that they've been running this place for 15 years. So at a guess, yeah. they've got a used entertainment operation going on here. And as part of that, they're probably always putting out the word for house clearances, bulk buy sales, things like that, just to try and get those bargains so that they can flip a profit. You know, that's that's their business there. Uh, and my guess is that they got lucky with this pickup. Um, somebody obviously said, oh, these guys are looking for exactly that. And um, there it is. And they, they also have a website that they seem to list this stuff on called thisisgameroom.com, where you can go and browse you know, old DVD box sets of friends and things like that, whatever it is that tickles your fancy. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing that they just worked hard to get the word out. And you know what they say, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And they got they got really lucky, but I'm not saying they didn't work for it. Now, looking through the video, Chris, um, did you see anything here that you would have liked to reach into the screen and pulled <laughs> out for yourself? Yeah, I did absolutely. But um, as you know, I'm I'm just trying to still recollect the games that I had growing up. So um, only a few stuck out from the footage that I saw. Uh, one was Alien vs Predator for the Atari Jaguar, uh, Street Fighter Two Turbo, which I believe was the SNES version, and same with Mortal Kombat. Um, but I mean, they sound like throwaway titles, but they really did, as you say. They look factory mint they're, they're just sealed boxes they look they look brand new um but yeah that's mm. all i'm after i'm not one to be greedy neil that'll do me yeah i, I don't think they pulled street fighter 2 out but you could see as the camera was passing by there was a cubby yeah. hole on the shelf with like six or seven copies of them all mint all stacked up and you could just see the street fighter logo and, and you were screaming at them pull that show us that one show us that one i hope this is yeah. why i hope we'll get another video about all of this in future so they're happy they've got their haul they've struck gold um but what about everyone else do you think somewhere out there in europe or maybe in australia there might still be that big box game hall waiting to be discovered nestled away in a warehouse next to the ark of the covenant maybe should we be hopeful chris and are you aware of any stories like this in your neck of the woods you want a story, Neil? Let me tell oh, you a story. I, I'm not sure, actually. I'm not sure. Oh, I'd like yeah, to me, know you It doesn't involve where, NBA where, where Jam or going? Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't involve NBA Jam or Dave or Mud, so you're safe. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, it's a, this is a story I've not even told on my own channel. Um, and it's a story that literally made me lose sleep. Um, and it's the story of the $5,000 Amiga haul. Okay, so yes, right here in Perth, through a friend in the Perth Amiga users group. And actually, he had a similar thing set up. So he's got an ongoing ad on Marketplace and Gumtree that basically says, you know, I'm after old computers. That's how we got wind of this. And we got wind of this $5,000 in Australian, so 250000 uh, 250, <laughs> Oh, my maths again, Neil. 2500 <laughs> uh, pounds. <laughs> um, but a massive haul of Amiga stuff. Um, was it worth the money being asked? Well, I'll let you decide, okay? This is what was in this haul from, from memory. So this, I think this is fairly accurate. Four Amiga 500s, two Amiga 1200s, at least two Amiga 600s, two CD32s, an Amiga 1000, an Amiga 2000, an Amiga 3000, an Amiga 4000, about six monitors. Um, some of those were boxed, by the way, um, uh, with all the manuals and everything. About six monitors, uh, printers, accelerator cards, um, external drives, boxes and boxes and boxes of Amiga magazines, boxes and boxes of discs. Um, and several boxed, complete, and again, mint-looking games, including, and these are just the ones that I can remember because they're the ones I wanted, um, Alien Breed 3D 1 and 2. I'm pretty sure number 2 was in there. Gloom, which I've now got. Banshee, Frontier, and Gunship 2000, just to name a few. And a heap of CD32 titles. I could only just see the spines in the photos that I saw. I didn't get to see what titles there were, but mm -hmm. there, there were heaps of those as well. Were, were so the many CD32 games. CD32 titles, were they boxed or were they dual cases? Because the boxed ones are so hard to come by. Uh, well, okay. So, yeah, in all honesty, those were, it was the side of the dual cases that I saw. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, um, what happened? Well, at the end of the day, that's a lot of money. Um, and it takes a lot of guts to just go, sure, I'll throw 5,000 at that, even though I only want some of it, especially if you're not into the hobby for flipping stuff, you know, you, you, mm. just, you really just want to buy what you want, but a haul like that, the guy doesn't want to split it, which is fair enough. Um, so this actually eventuated over a couple of months and we came up with a plan. So we basically had a syndicate of about four of us to get the money together and we each agreed who was going to buy what. Um, we had confirmation from the seller that we could collect the whole lot on this particular weekend. And then suddenly out of the blue, because this wasn't even advertised on Marketplace or anywhere. So it was because of the guy in the Perth Amiga users group who had his own advert that he'd been approached to say, do you want this lot of stuff? wasn't advertised for sale anywhere suddenly on the thursday before the weekend it appeared on marketplace and we're like oh, no. wait a minute what the heck's going on so that basically the seller's son had got involved he's assuming that his dad's um just dealing with some time wasters who aren't going to turn up which does happen in all fairness mm. um i won't go into full details but basically we got we got wind that all was not well and somebody was trying to snipe us so i checked with the son i made i made contact with the son and Again, we got written confirmation from the Sun to say, yes, the whole lot is on hold for you. Don't worry about it. But we still heard over and over again that other people were going to look at the stuff. So it all got very messy. Um, it was like an episode of Storage Wars, and I'm not even exaggerating <laughs> when I say that. It was, it was crazy. So at one point, I'm literally in my car. I'm on the phone to the actual seller, and I'm saying to him, I've got $2,000 in my hand right now, and I'm in my car. I can be at your house in 20 minutes to pay you this money and I'll grab the rest of the money off the guys this afternoon and we'll work something out. Is it worth me driving to your house right now? To which he replied that another guy was already on the way. Oh, no. And that was the first time I'd spoken to the actual seller because somebody else had been dealing, somebody else from the syndicate had been dealing with him up until that point. And straight away, I could tell this was an old guy. He was a lovely sounding old man. He didn't want to offend anyone, anybody. He wanted to do the right thing. Um, but he was kind of caught in the middle at this point now. So at that point, I had to back right off because, you know, that's just not me to, to push my way in. So we backed off. Um, long story short, we lost it, and we've got no idea who got in first. Um, I do actually have my suspicions because Perth is a small place, um, but at the end of the day, you know, first to show up with cash wins, and that's the reality of these things. Uh, but I just want those games, Neil. <laughs> that's all I want. I just want the games, um, but they've not shown up for sale yet. But that's my story, Neil, um, and I don't like to talk about it. 
No, so near yet so far. Um, I guess yeah. when these things happen, you, you know, you've got to have the cash ready and you've just got to say, uh, I, I'm ready right now. I'm going to get in the car. I'm going to buy it and then sort out the syndicate side of things later, I guess. Otherwise, there's always yeah. that risk of losing it. But it's a, a lesson learned, <laughs> a hard Absolutely. lesson learned, really gutting. Um, I have a story that's not quite as gutting, but but it was it was a bit of a wild ride. Um a few years back when I was doing an Amiga 4000 Trash to Treasure, a viewer got in touch with me. And um, at first they said, oh, I see you're doing the Trash to Treasure on the 4000. I've got a video toaster. I'm based in the US and, um, you know, you might want this for the series. I said, well, that could be interesting. Thanks so much for thinking of me. And then they came back and said, of course, you know, you need an NTSC Amiga 4000. So um, I'll throw that in. And I'm like, whoa, that, that's that's seriously generous. Okay. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, thank you very much. I'll cover the postage costs, whatever you need me to do. And then this thing kind of snowballed and snowballed, and I kept getting more and more emails say, uh, saying, um, well, well, the story just got more and more elaborate. So it went on to say, I work at a TV studio, and we've got this storage unit. And um, actually, we've got like two Amiga 4000s and um, a video toaster and this other kind of video toaster, I can't remember the name of it, sealed in box. Oh, and a bunch of cameras and a bunch of microphones and, and, and mixing equipment. And, and it just grew and grew and grew, this list. And um, whenever anyone offers me a donation, my first reaction is always, that's super kind of you. You know, thanks so mm. much for thinking of me. But there's always an element in my mind that is, this isn't real until it turns up. You know, mm, people, yeah. people change their mind and that's fine. Um, but also you get trolls. And mm. they, they they pushed and pushed and pushed, <clears throat> and, and the list kept growing. And I don't know, I mean, clearly you can already tell by the way I'm telling this story, I didn't get any of this stuff. Oh. Oh. But um, at one point, at one point they were talking about me paying the shipping cost up front. And that, of course, that rang alarm bells. I'm not going to hand over mm. money. You know, if you want to send it to me, I'll pay the shipping in full when it arrives. Um, and mm. then I don't know. I think they were just kind of fishing for some kind of reaction that they might be able to use from me, either when they flipped the switch and it turned out none of this was coming to see if I got angry or ungrateful. Mm. I don't know what they were fishing for, but they obviously mm. got bored in the end and, and it just went dead and I heard nothing more. But yeah, there was this period where I thought, is this really going to happen? Is, is, is all this mega haul of Amiga kit going to come over? Um, I wouldn't say I was disappointed because I never quite truly believed. But yeah, that's my right. story of the haul that never was, Chris. <laughs> no. We all got yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd be interested to hear any listeners' stories, you know, uh, and also uh, any listeners out there that, that feel like they need to confess and come clean with Chris. Was it you in Perth who beat him to the haul? Come on. We're all friends. You, you come on the show. Tell us about it. Tell us your side of the story. You know, maybe they'd struck up a conversation with this old guy and it was all nice. And then they suddenly got wind that there's this guy called Chris and he's fishing and he's trying to snipe me. And I got to get over Come there. Come on the quick. show and give me prices for the games. That's all I ask. <laughs> <laughs> Love to hear that side of the story. Or, or are you my troll? Are you the person that was emailing me from supposedly the other side of the world, but it could have been anywhere? Come on, come clean. We can pixelate your face and we can distort your voice in kind of a crime watch style. <laughs> and uh, you can tell us your side of the story. Um, otherwise, let us know, listeners, your whole successes or failures, the ones that got away. Um, let us know all about mm. it on the subreddit. And um, this particular game hall, let's, let's go back to what the story was all about. Um, have a look at the video. <laughs> <laughs> have a look at the video and see what you think and do these games warrant those ludicrous prices i mean we haven't even mentioned what a grading have we this is just as they are mm. new in box i mean are they going to go and send them off to be graded and then suddenly they're going to be listed at ten thousand, twenty thousand pounds we'll have to wait and see but check out the video anyway lemmings neil it's 30 mm -hmm. years old so that's nice <laughs> Um, That's nice. And if you've got, <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and if you've got two hours to spare, there's a documentary on YouTube all about it. Um, and guess what, Neil? What, Chris? I, I, I've got a terrible feeling you're going to tell me you've never played Lemmings. Oh, I had to fish you in there. Wrong, <laughs> completely wrong. It's actually okay. a game I have played. <laughs> yes, at last, one, the, one that I've actually played. We're talking about it. Um, I told you they exist. Um, but, I mean, who hasn't who hasn't played Lemmings? Um, I, I never really went for what I would call cutesy games. Uh, and to be honest, I'm no fan of puzzlers either. But Lemmings, I mean, come on. You can't help but love it. 
save them, kill them. It doesn't matter. It's always fun. Um, I think I first played it as the demo. I'm pretty sure it was on an Amiga format cover disc, the demo, um, and later the full game. Uh, although the demo, from my memories anyway, it was certainly one of those demos that gave you more than enough um, to to keep you playing. Um but it, it goes back to the discussion from previous weeks, I think, Neil, about games that just have instant appeal. They're just easy to pick up um, and almost impossible to put down. And this was sh- certainly one of those. It's such an original concept, um, or it was at the time. Um, do you remember when you first played it, Neil? What were your first impressions? Um, I do. Um, it would have been the Amiga version. I don't remember owning a boxed copy, though, Chris. Let's put it that way. Um <laughs> I do remember the demo. I think there were maybe two or three levels on it. You're right. Mm. It, it did keep you keep you engaged. It certainly gave you a good flavor of the game. I remember there were a lot of reviews and a lot of hype for it. Amiga Format were on board from the beginning. They absolutely loved this game. And it did feel really fresh and fun when it arrived. Um, I played Lemmings from start to finish. I was absolutely hooked on it. You know, the wow. demo, the full game. Um, what was the add-on? Oh, no more Lemmings. All of that. Um, I, I kind of exhausted myself of lemmings before I got to lemmings too, but the original lemmings, I was, I was all over that. Um, and I'd like to think that my slightly nefarious ownership of the original game has been forgiven, um, because I've got a little prop next to me. I'll describe it for the audio listeners. This is, this was sent to me recently, and this is a, a framed copy of lemmings. And, uh, Ooh, yep. I don't know if you can see it, but it's signed in a silver pen, um, and that silver pen says, Neil, a true believer from Mike Daly. It's signed by who is, of course, one of the original developers. So, um, beautiful. yeah, I can now legally play the game. I mean, he's ruined the box by scribbling all over it, but I can legally play the game. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of Windex so, to clean that off now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll get that, we'll get that cleaned up and I'll iron the box, make it nice and flat. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it is actually something I'm really proud of to have to put up in the, in the cave up on the wall here how about you chris can you remember you obviously played the demo did you then go out and buy the game what was your what was your lemon story yeah yeah no i did and I, I do remember you seeing that signed copy on your channel as well and being very jealous when i saw that turn up that's a beautiful thing to have um yeah i do i, mean, I remember playing the demo like i said and i remember playing the full game but i don't remember buying the full game um, if that makes sense. But I don't think I had a pirate copy. I, it's funny the things that stick in my mind, but I remember the games that I acquired um, through, you know, um, mm. less than legitimate means, and I don't think because, that was one of them. Yeah, you had the Batman pack. I know you, you've told us that in yeah. the past. So that yeah. wouldn't have come with Lemmings, but it was a pack in no. with, was it the Cartoon Classics pack? You got a little Lemmings with it. Um, and yeah. I always liked the packing games because they came in miniaturized boxes. It was like the full box That's art, right. but everything was shrunk down. Like when you put a crisp packet into the oven and it shrinks down. <laughs> you know? I remember That's doing what the that. Packing yeah, games we called them like. shrinky dinks. Yeah. <laughs> shrinky dinks. And then you turn them Shrinky into a key dudes. ring or something. Anyway, going well off oh, track here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all good. Well, yeah, I think I think either I borrowed it off a mate. That's quite possible. Um, I was very good at borrowing games and just holding on to them for weeks. Um, or m- maybe my nephew, because he had an Amiga as well. Or it's quite possible that I purchased it from the Home Computer Club. It, it really is, because you had to buy a game every month. It's kind of a blur what I acquired through those means. Um, but I definitely remember playing the full game. If you had the Home Computer Club one, that was a special edition. It had uh, some extra levels just for the Home Computer Club on it. And oh, uh, did it. See, okay. th- this is going to annoy you now because you're going to have to go out and buy yeah. that same copy. I know you like to buy the things you originally had. But the Home Computer so Club one, the, on the disc itself, it says it says Home Computer Club on the disc. So you know it's a slightly different one. So there you go. That's, oh, that's what okay. you've got to go on the hunt for. I'll have to look for that, yeah, and see if that was the one. Oh, no, that's a whole new rabbit hole you've sent me down now. Thanks for that. (laughs) (laughs) I I think I do need to own a copy for the shelf, though, but I don't know if I'm going to be that fussy about it. Just the big box will do me. Um, But I don't want to pay the current eBay prices, to be honest. Um, So uh, we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, But anyway, the story is is it. I mean, so many, there there must be so many copies of Lemmings out there. Is it it an expensive one to get hold of? Yeah, I think some of these eBay sellers need to have the principles of supply and demand explained to them because that really is the mm-hmm. case. It's it's often the most popular games that we know sold, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of copies, depending on what system you're talking about. 
And because they knew they were popular, they're the ones that they jacked the prices up on. I don't understand that. But anyway, yeah. that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the story today really isn't about Lemmings itself, I guess, but about this documentary, which has been put together by Exient um, and shared with us on the subreddit by Oz Retrocomp. Um, yes, it is two hours long. There's no get away, getting away from that. But what it is, is a really nice chronological telling of the story about the game's creation. It's very cleverly edited together by slicing in a bunch of online interviews with the game's creators, um, people like Russell Kay, Mike Daly, and David Jones, and Tim Wright for the music, and a whole host of other XDMA um, developers, ex-Signosis, and current gaming commentators as well. They all chime in. And they all weigh in with their thoughts and memories of the game, but also of the game's development. Um, not just of this iconic game, but of the circumstances around its inception. And that's the bit that really interests me. What I really enjoy uh, enjoyed most, Neil, and what I really always enjoy about, you know, hearing on other documentaries like this or interviews on channels like your own or... Um, retro that other retro podcast team i can't remember their name um but you know when you get into the origin stories of of where these people came from and how they got into the industry and how they had their big break moment um these guys got to know each other mostly through the local computer club the kingsway amateur computer club they didn't study games development i mean you couldn't really do that back in the day they got out there and they made contacts and they made games um and, you, and so it was really something you just did back then that's the impression i get the more of these stories that i hear you just got on and did it um so i don't know i, I find those those that part of the story almost more interesting than the development cycle of the game itself um were you a budding games developer at all neil was that something you mm. intended to do with your life well, um, who who didn't want to be a games developer? Um, and I should say, shout out, shout out, Chris, to the Retro Hour. Let's let's not censor the Retro Hour. Dan and Ravi. Oh, that's, so who, good it to us. Yeah, that's, that's who it was. Yeah, that's who it was. Good guys. Um, but yeah, uh, first of all, the documentary. It's a great story, and as you say, all of the the people involved all seem to have their own skills that complemented each other so well. You know, you had Mike who loved the techie stuff. And uh, a name that you didn't mention, Steve, Steve Hammond. We mustn't forget him. He was oh, yeah. great with the art, among other things. Um, and it was just a coming together of friends that you kind of wish that you had. You wish that this was your circle of friends when you look back on this mm. story. In my own circumstances, I was always tinkering away, yes, making games or at least trying to make games. Um, you, you know, some examples I can give you were um, when we were at college and we were studying Pascal. I remember I was able to entertain people by making that classic uh, game that's been done a million times, Tron Light Cycles. Started oh. off with 1v1 and then I expanded it to four players so we'd all crowd around the keyboard. Um, and then um, moved on to C where I did kind of a scrolling tile mapped shooter. It was kind of a, a homage to Harrier Attack, which in turn was a, a ripoff of Scramble. So I made, made that kind of game. Um, and I was quite proud of that because not only did I kind of make the game, I also programmed... Um, Okay, I use this word very loosely, the development tools. So, so the level editor. <laughs> so I made a separate program where you could pull in the tile map, point and click to put your tiles where you wanted, go back and forward on layers a little bit like Photoshop. So you could put your tiles on different layers and set the scroll speed for each layer. So you could create that kind of parallax effect. So um, wow. yeah, this is going back some time, but I really enjoyed doing that when I had the time to do that kind of thing. Um and I actually reinstalled some of those tools for the first time in over 20 years uh, over Christmas when I had a little bit of time over Christmas and thought I'd go back and remind myself what it was all about. So I had this thing called DJGPP. Uh, there was an IDE that sat on top of it called RIDE, R-H-I-D-E. Um, and then I would lean heavily into the, a function library called Allegro, which helped with all the graphical bits. So... I did a, you know, Pascal, I did C, I did Blitz Basic later. I did all of these things, but I never, ever got down to that bare metal kind of assembly language coding. I never broke into mm -hmm. that because by the time I was doing things like this, uh, I was on a 486 or a Pentium PC at this point. You know, I was making, I was fiddling around with DOS games when everyone else commercially was doing Windows games. So it already felt, you know, 
old and, and hobbyist what I was doing. Yeah. But it was fun to do and it was nice to pick these puzzles apart and, and take on these little challenges. So yeah, I had fun trying to make games and I did actually then progress to university doing software engineering. But as soon as I went into, well, you've got to make this bit of software for this business case. And I wanted to make parallax scrollers. <laughs> I just thought, no, this, yeah. this is taking the fun out of it now. I, I, I'll just carry on doing that as a hobby. And, and I went off and did IT support um, and servers and things like that. But I never really fully got back into the coding again as a hobby. Um, I don't know if I ruined it for myself. I don't, I, oh, I just ran out of time or real life got in the way. I don't know. But yes, I did, like so many others, dream of being a game developer. Um, <laughs> and, um, this is why I like this story so much because I can dream of having that group of friends of thinking, well, what if I had, you know, other people when I was slaving away till four in the morning, drinking black coffee, trying to keep myself awake to come up with solutions to the problems I had for my little scroller. What if there were five or six of us? What if we were all bouncing off of each other and we had this computer club to go to, you know? Yeah. I think everyone yeah. would have loved to have experienced that. Um, or maybe it's just me being a massive nerd, but I love I love the idea of that. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so the DMA story I think is the dream that we all wanted to live out. Chris, am I yeah, am I wrong? No, I am I right? <laughs> no, no, I, I, you're exactly right. And funnily enough, I, I um I did A level computer science. That's where I did Pascal and Cobol, and all we learned how to do was do a stock control system. It wasn't for a VHS video store, was it? Because that's what we had to do in COBOL, a stock control system for videos. Uh, I can't remember what the initial exercise was, but I turned it into um, like a weapon stock for because flight simulated <laughs> in, in, interest. So, yeah, <laughs> keeping track of weapons on a, on an air base, that's, that's what, how I made it more interesting in my own head. But I know for a fact that every person sitting in that classroom during that A-level wanted to be a games developer and that was not what we were being taught at all like i said you, could, you couldn't study it back then so i think if i had my time again i'd put my head down and i'd really work at that dream um you only have your time once and <laughs> maybe our time has passed who knows um it's easy looking back now you know these lessons are here for all to see in videos like this if you wanted a job in making games you made games. Um, and Mike Daly actually said that it was a big step for him, you know, socially to actually um, go out and attend the computer club. But that step was life changing. Um, and in my view, nothing has changed. Now, yes, you can study it now. But the fact remains, the people who get the jobs are not the ones necessarily with a piece of paper in their hands, but the ones that actually have a portfolio, they're actually making games because it truly is their passion. Um, I mean, you know, just to come up with a completely fictional scenario, Neil, that may seem a tad specific. Um, but let's say right now I was, I don't know, 22 years old and I was studying games art design right here in Perth right now. And let's say I actually had a group of friends around me. Um, and let's just pretend that among that group of friends, we had a coder, a 3D modeler, an animator, a graphic artist and a musician capable of composing their own digital music. Well, if that were me, Neil, I'd, I'd yes, I'd keep studying because, you know, why not get that piece of paper? But I'd get that crew together and I'd have a meeting and I'd start bashing games out tomorrow. Um, does that sound like a plan? Is that what you'd do? Um, that would be your intention, Chris. But what would happen is you'd get out the N64 and you'd all play Goldeneye on Big Telly. And, and the game true. making would never happen. <laughs> That's that what would happen. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's easy to say that you, you can have all of the individual talents all, all in the same room, but you still need to find that game idea that makes you want to commit all of the time and all of the effort into creating it um, and taking it past a tech demo into a complete game. Um, something that I've learned from interviewing people over the years, like Mike, like Richard Garriott, and more recently, reading um, Sid Meier's um, Sid Meier's uh, uh, biography, um, he of pirates and civilization fame, is that the idea for a game rarely comes from these people in a eureka moment. Um, hmm. a, a lot of the biggest games have come through play itself, so through coders playing with ideas, throwing code at the screen, seeing if things work, and then honing in on a single mechanic or a behavior that comes out of these little tech demos and experiments that they, that they do, and seeing if that might have the potential to turn into a game. And bringing it back to Lemmings, Lemmings is a great example of that. It all came about because of a silly, gory death animation that was done on Deluxe Paint, I think it was. And then um, 
the spark of an idea really caught fire from that, didn't it? Uh, that's very true. And uh, I mean, but they do say, you know, every success is built on a thousand failures as well, or, or something like that, something smart sounding like that. Um, but what I mean is you won't, you won't find that idea and unless you start trying ideas in the first place, you know. Um, but anyway, do check out the video. And I just want to say, well, a happy birthday to Lemmings this year. Um, and a huge thanks to Exient for putting this documentary together. Um, and of course, to the developers of Lemmings, not only for the amazing gaming memories that you've given all of us, but for sharing your stories in this documentary and being an inspiration to generations of developers. And I really hope that those with a chance today find the exit that leads to their dreams in games development rather than following the rest of us off the cliff, just looking back in midlife thinking, oh, no. Listener Plum Creek submitted this story to the sub this week, and it's a good one. Someone has been digging around into the patent application archives and discovered an unreleased Nintendo dev kit, but not the mysterious never-to-be-seen type that you have to sign an NDA for to get hold of at your game studio. This was a dev kit for the masses. Named the Nintendo Game Processor, it's a tower-like device. Um, The first thing that struck my mind when I saw the picture of it was a PCFX, kind of tower-like console hybrid looking device. Um, It's got a cartridge slot in the top, It's got four Super Nintendo controller ports at the front, uh, supposedly two for pads, uh, one for a keyboard and one for a mouse. And uh, it used cartridges that were battery backed up so you could write to them and then you could put them into a a regular console. So you take them out the top of the tower, put them in a regular console to try out your game that you'd put on there. Um, Those cartridges do actually come up for sale once in a while. So they obviously found an application somewhere. Uh, and written on those cartridges is a, a label that says Game Processor RAM Cassette. So that's what they were called. And the patent goes on to describe a visual game making system. The example given is called Mario Factory, in which you create levels. Uh, there's also a paint package and there's a music making program. And in that example, it all comes together to give you yourself a, a customized um, Super Mario game experience. So effectively, what you have here is a PC-type device coupled with Super Nintendo hardware and a visual game creation system. Now, this isn't the first time that Nintendo have encouraged development. There was, of course, the Famicom Basic system, I think it was called, where you had um, a keyboard that came with it and you could you could do some basic coding and it had some functions for putting sprites on the screens and making noises. Um, very limited in the memory that you had to work with to do that on, but it was a thing. Um, You also had creative titles like Mario Paint. Um, And this system, though, is quite interesting because the more you look into it, the more you realize that it looks very much like the more recent Mario Maker. This system has never actually been seen in the wild, to my knowledge. So how far it got in its creation, I don't really know. But it's a really interesting one to read about. Now, despite loving the look of this thing, I'm going to make a sweeping assumption here, Chris. I'm going to guess that this might have been, if it had ever come out, one of those Nintendo things that, well, if it made it to market, maybe came out in Japan and no further. You know, there are all these kind of quirky, interesting, fun things that we want so desperately that never seem to make it out to the international market. And I don't know, I just I just have a feeling that this might have been one of those things. Um, I'd love to have tried it, though. I think it could have been a really nice stepping stone to inspire gamers to, to take their first steps, just as some of the more visual game creation software that we had on our PCs and Amigas and Atari STs uh, were for us. So um, I'm going to turn a question back on you that you put to me in the last story, Chris. Have you ever been Fair much enough. of a game developer? <laughs> Well, um, yeah, it goes on to what we were talking about earlier. Definitely, uh, I think a lot of us who play games wanted to make them as well. I think as far as far as I got, well, it wasn't very far, not as far as you. Um, tinkering about with trying to make a game in Spectrum Basic and failing. Um, I remember one day I actually sat down. Well, it was more than a day. I sat down. I thought I'm going to get my head around this, and I looked up all the commands from the manual that I thought I needed about you know draw commands and stuff like this. And I got as far as I think it's is there a wait key command or something so that the machine is waiting for an input from particular keys and using that to actually move a, 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 a plot point around. But then I was using the draw command to do the graphics because I didn't know any other way. So essentially, every time I hit a key, it was having to redraw the entire sprite. <laughs> so because it wasn't even a sprite it was literally i was using plot and draw command so it was it was terrible and i got that far and thought this is not how you do it 
I was at least sensible enough to realise that at that point. You say that, Chris, but, um, you know, there was a man out there doing just that in Kevin Toms with Kevin Toms Football Manager, which was made in basic on pretty much every platform going from the Dragon 32 to the ZX Spectrum and, and more besides. So, you know, could we have had Chris's... Um, missile stop control system manager it could have been a thing <laughs> yeah that's true i mean yes you can make a game in 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 uh, basic but not the way i was doing it i really don't think i was using the right commands at all so i got as far as realizing that i was doing it wrong and i never progressed to working out how to do it right sadly um moving on to the amiga though i mean you had some you know those sort of high level tools we didn't need to know coding and I, I did play about with shoot 'em up construction kit which funnily enough there's my term for a prop i've got that here repurchased copy um in box so oh, same now, version as I is had. that the um sorry just hold that up again so for yeah. for the listeners that's a pretty much all blue box with shoot 'em up construction kit on the front was that the original release because i know there were a lot of budget releases of this thing that came later that looked quite different is yeah it's it the release came? i'm familiar with let me put it that way this is definitely i mean this is a repurchase um as all my collection are but um, this is definitely the box I remember, and I'm pretty sure I bought this as soon as it came out. Um, and it's got the full manual and everything, you know. So mm-hmm. I, I think it's the original release, Neil. Um, well, there was the C64 the one I remember. version as well, wasn't there? Um, yes, there was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm assuming um, I'm just going to assume in... everything you have is Amiga. So, <laughs> ah, now that's yes. another one. Yeah, you've got 3D construction kit there. You're holding up. Tell us about that. Yeah, that's right. So this is the this is the small book. This is definitely a home computer uh, com- home computer club purchase. The you know the magazine we had to buy um, every month. But this is, I think I'm remembering it right. I mean, obviously these things were a long time ago, Neil. But I'm pretty sure this was the one that got me to sign up. Do you remember how they really had the one to get you to sign up was a really good title at an extremely cheap price, um, mm-hmm. and that's how they got you in to sign up. And then you were you were basically legally bound to buy one game every month and the same kind of um uh deal they had a music never club, came up they? after you'd yeah they had it music very they had book clubs music. and everything mm. yeah yeah and so you, you had a really good deal to suck you in and then the deals were never quite as good down the track unfortunately but you had to keep buying once a month so 3d construction kit i definitely played with that as well um and in fact I'm currently back into shoot 'em up construction kits. So are going back into that. Um, on my own channel, I did a Christmas giveaway where I promised that I would make a game. And I did promise that it would be a bad game because that's the way <laughs> it's going to turn out. So I was completely transparent. I said, it's going to be terrible, but I'll make a game in shoot 'em up construction kit. And actually, Richard Shears from, from your Discord channel, um, he won it this year. So I've still got to finish. Sorry, Rich. Um, <laughs> I've had a lot on, but I've still got to finish that game and, and post it out to, to Rich. Um, so it's actually does good it, fun um, to get back into. Knowing Richard, does this game you're making involve Elmo? No, but it should. <laughs> I already <laughs> yeah, had a thing. The a game was already started when I ran the competition, but I, yeah, it's not finished yet. <laughs> Could I throw in an Elmo? Mm. Oh, oh, Maybe you just give a voice. Me something to think about there. Yes, <laughs> that would be a good thing, thing to to try and do, actually. But yeah, um, and again, the game's not going to be good, uh, and he knows that. That's part of the promise. But I mean, these tools were a great fun way, I think, to, but they're, they're extremely limited. They're actually not an excuse, Neil. I can't remember which developer it, or developer it was, but I think it was on an interview that the Retro Hour did. I can't remember the name of the developer, but part of his origin story was what he submitted to the first publisher that took him up and gave him a full-time paid job was a demo game that he produced in Shoot 'em Up Construction Kit. So here's me going, well, of course, the tool wasn't a bad workman blames his tools. Is that right? There were probably other examples, but Stu Cambridge did that. Um, okay. uh, he even he even modified shoot 'em up construction kit a little bit to hide the fact that it was using shoot 'em up construction kit and then he well, used his go. pixel art and made a little little game um and that's how yeah. he got into the games industry so yeah there were people that managed to do it yeah 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 it's crazy so we can't we can't blame the tool i mean they are very limited you know we, we have to acknowledge that but it's it's still no excuse but anyway i mean going back to this story i would have loved a tool like this for making hybrid games for the snes um that would have been awesome but i think you're right i think um i mean my japanese is just too rusty to have ever managed to purchase something like this i doubt we'd have ever seen it in the uk yeah you mentioned 3d construction kit that you held up there um did that small box version of it come with the vhs because i had like a a black one with a flap on the front that opened up and you had a gold vhs cassette game with it with with the tutorial did you get the tape with yours 
No, that's right. I, I remember I remember the legend of the, the VHS tutorial, <laughs> and I certainly wanted that. Um, but it didn't come with this small box version. No, it didn't. Um, and okay. I later had Shoot'em Up Construction Kit, or it went through an... What was it called on the PC? Virtual Studio or something? Um, is that it? I think it's Virtual Studio. Virtual or... Studio. I've not heard of that one. You had some yeah, other yeah. visual ones on the PC, like click and play later and things yeah, like no, that. But no, it was definitely company. it was a version of the same thing. So it was Freescape, but for the PC. Um, so oh, I mean, in okay. terms of how, yeah, yeah, in terms of how I used them, I mean, but with. Um, 3D construction kit on the Amiga, which is the first version I had. I made a game because I was going through my GCSEs at the time. Um, so I made a game called Exam Zone, um, a game that only I've ever played, of course, because it wasn't good enough to put out there, but it was based on my school. I was always very good at rebuilding real life places, if that makes sense. Um, and I went on to do the same in things like Unreal Tournament and Duke Build and stuff like that. That would rather than come up, imagine a, a level design, it was much easier to pick a place in the back of my memory uh, and use that. So Exam Zone was based on the school that I went to. And the idea was you had to find a certain room because in the certain room on the blackboard was a map of the exam room and it told you which seat you had to sit in oh, um, my God. and then you had to find the hall where the exam was taking place and then sit in the right seat otherwise the ceiling came down and crushed you and essentially that was the whole game but anyway um and then in the pc version uh, and i really wish i could remember i'm pretty sure it was virtual studio but anyway um i, I basically i went to the trouble and i spent a lot of time on this basically building what i would call a demo level of a game that i would then want to get published and i actually approached a, a small developer with it um but by that point we're talking you know doom had been out for a long time and essentially <laughs> that's exactly what they said to me they said okay this is interesting um we couldn't get past this but in all honesty can you make anything that looks like doom <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of that conversation. I was I was several years too late with that. So at least I tried. Yeah. At least I tried. Um, but yeah, I, I remember the VHS. Um, I remember hearing about it, but it didn't come in the small box. I'm pretty sure it didn't come with the version that I had on PC either. And so earlier today, I actually had a quick look on YouTube just because you, you can see the VHS on YouTube and watching it doesn't ring any bell. So I don't think I ever got the privilege of watching that. Um, maybe it would have helped. <laughs> who knows yeah, what yeah. about yourself so um yeah i mean it sounds like we have uh, plenty of experience in trying out anything and everything that promises to make us a game developer with minimum effort that was always what hooked you in with these things um 3d construction kit was brilliant because you'd had all the freescape games before it and you thought yeah i can make one of them i can make a total eclipse or a um castle master or something like that and like you i never got any further than making what i was familiar with i made my house um, yeah. It wasn't quite as boring as having to sit an exam, but um, you, you know you had to get up the giant staircase and um, and and down the giant staircase. I don't think I made much more than the hall in the kitchen, to be honest. <laughs> but it still sounds better than your virtual exam simulator. But um, <laughs> ultimately, you know, effort was rewarded ultimately, and if you were able to get under the hood and and, and programming. C or assembly or anything like that you had the flexibility to really create what you want but i know why these th systems were so attractive because they were time savers and they promised you results um and uh some people were lucky enough to get results that got them into the industry but let's come back on to um this system the nintendo development system or at least what we know of it from the patent form um what do you think of this system in particular does it appeal to you would you have got it Oh, yeah. Look, if it had been made available, absolutely. Um, I remember even on the Philips G7000, which I've got one sitting behind me, there was a cartridge that I never actually got my hands on, which was, I think it was just called Basic or something, Basic Cartridge. And again, I wanted that because of the promise in my head of, and I would have only been about eight at that point in time, well, that would let me make games. I don't know if it actually did, but anything that would let me live that dream of making games, absolutely I'd have been interested in. Um, it does touch on one of my pet peeves though, Neil, and that is, a games console is always a very capable system, but they're always locked solidly down into one task, and that one task is load game. I'm simplifying it, but that's the way I see it. Um, and that continues to this day. Uh, a PS4 or a PS5, in my view, could be a producti uh, productivity tool. Um, and you know you could allow development tools on those but they're locked down and they're locked down solidly and they're forced to be a fraction of what is possible on a single device uh, it's just my opinion obviously um do you agree neil 
Yeah, I know what you mean. It does feel like a lot of wasted power sometimes. But um, if we just go back to the fact that I didn't own Lemmings when it came out, maybe if mm. I'd bought Lemmings uh, and put money in the developers' pockets, then there wouldn't be such a need for closed-off systems because it is as simple as that. Consoles have to be cheap to get into the homes. Um, and then they subsidize that through the games. Uh, and the whole model falls down if the subsidy is lost. You just, you just need to look at what happened to the Sega Dreamcast to see how that doesn't work. So um, what I do find frustrating, though, is when they tease you with that kind of functionality. So, for example, um, Linux on the PlayStation 2, they raved about that. And then a little bit later, they took it all away in a, in a future model. You could no longer do that with that model. So that was kind of frustrating to be tantalized with it. But even when it was there, you know, a, a large part of the system was was locked off. You couldn't go making, I don't think you could go making 3D games and things like that with it. You were just doing kind of productivity um, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I, I don't really blame them. Um, but either way, I think it's only a matter of time now before something like the Xbox is either running windows so you can sort of drop out of the dashboard and go into a full-blown windows desktop windows experience um or maybe it comes with a remote hosted vm of of windows that you can drop into to do your homework or anything you want i think you know it's always been a great market employee to sell a games machine as something that you can do your homework on and i think as these consoles now become more and more pc like because that's just the way they're going that it's going to be very difficult for a company like microsoft to resist using that tactic um so i i, I wouldn't be surprised if before long we have more of a pc like experience and more access to those things but there will always be the lockdowns to to try and prevent the um the piracy and the, and the loss of subsidy so i don't quite know how they'll tackle that chris um just just my to sense you have sense in australia yep. <laughs> yes we do in fact have sense in australia <laughs> just don't ask me to do the maths yeah sense not sense <laughs> sense um no we don't anyway. have sense in australia definitely not <laughs> anyway this whole nintendo dev kit is it's another really interesting bit of tech history that's been unearthed the nintendo game processor a future that never really came to pass at least until mario maker this last story uh, was brought to us by Remington Noiseless, and it's an interview with Dr. Tim King, the creator of Amiga DOS, and his wife Jessica, who I understand, among many other things, um, created and also Americanized the documentation. The interview is conducted very professionally by Keith Mortimer, who is a volunteer at the Museum of Computing in Swindon and owner of YouTube channel The Digital Orphanage. I have to confess, I went into this assuming it was going to be mainly about um, Workbench and Amiga DOS in the context of the command line interface. In actual fact, it's on a much higher level, or, or I should probably say a much lower level um, than that. Dr. King, in fact, created, well, the disk operating system, the very code that made the Amiga work at all. The code it needs to tell the Motorola 68000 to get out of bed in the morning and go and find out what post has just arrived through the letterbox, or in this case, the disk drive. He details his previous work with Tripos and later um, with the release of the 68000, his early work with the CPU. And uh, the interview is masterfully steered, I think, by Keith uh, to move on from that history in a chronological order to the King's work with Commodore and essentially Dr. King being the man to actually make it work at all, much to the delight of the Americans. Now, I'm not going to lie, Neil. This video for me was like thinking you're going to a year one, day one class and finding yourself in the wrong room and you're actually actually in a third year lecture or, or worse, an exam. Um, much of it was actually way over my head. Machine switch on, machine play games. That's, that's my level. Do you know what I mean? So... Of course, I'm aware that low-level code has to control and pass every single bit that passes from any input through the CPU and RAM to form any kind of output. Of course, I have that understanding. But to even contemplate it for me is like, well, it's like the Matrix. You know, only Neo and Dr. King have that kind of power, or maybe Flynn <laughs> from Tron. Um, however, it's it was still an extremely interesting interview, um, and I like to see interviews like this when carried out this well not as retro entertainment, but as an important archive of story and fact. 
Keith, in my view, is not a presenter here. He's a historian. And that is so important in my view. What did you think, Neil? Um, I thought it was absolutely excellent. And I think whether you have an interest in this or not, you should go and watch it for the for the story, for the narrative that runs straight through the middle of this, through all the technical details and all the rest of it. There are some real gems in there about the launch of the Amiga, about the arrival of the 68000 CPU, who was using it, um, uh, what Dr. King could do with it. Um, it. It's just just a really brilliant interview. And I think Keith does some really important things here. Um, I, I'm going to point out, um, when, uh, when Keith snagged this interview, um, it, it was a really brilliant person to get hold of. Um, he actually contacted me and asked me if I wanted to be involved in in the recording of it and, and the interview. Uh, and this was at the peak of my uh, doing the building the DIY. I just had absolutely no time. So I had to say to him, no. And I'm really, really pleased that I was busy and, and he went out and did this on his own because I don't think he's done any interviews on his channel before. So this is his, his first one. I, I'm pretty sure that's, that's correct. And um, knowing Keith as I do, because he's local to me and I, I've got to know him um, over at the computer museum and we've made some videos together. Um, I know that he would have been a little bit worried going into this because, um, that's, that's just his nature. And because of that, he would have made sure that he was well prepared to counter that. So, um, he would have got all his questions right and his sub questions to go off on the various tangents if he needed to. And he would have been really respectful and aware that he didn't want to go and waste Dr. King's time. And for that reason, he would have been incredibly well prepared. And it really shows in the video that he's got his questions lined up, that he's done his research, and that he steers it so perfectly, he navigates his interview perfectly through not just the technicalities, and, and he, he holds his own on the technical questions. He can follow up on technical answers and say, what about this? What about that? But also through the whole story of Dr. King's story is not just an Amiga story. It's before, during, and after the Amiga. And he just navigates it masterfully. And I hope that Keith goes on to do more interviews um, because he's proven that he can do it so well. So um, well done, Keith. I think you did brilliantly. Sorry I couldn't be there um, to be a part of it. But also, I'm really glad that I had no part in this whatsoever <laughs> and you were able to do this. Um, so well done, Keith. Um, some of the highlights for me were uh, Dr. King. I, I won't give too many spoilers, but Dr. King's opinion of the famous glitz and glamour of the Lincoln Center launch of the Amiga 1000. Um, you know, this is the one where Andy Warhol was there flood filling a picture of Deb, Debbie Harry that he put on the screen. <laughs> yes. And um, well, I won't ruin it, but he didn't, he didn't hold that event in a particularly high opinion <laughs> that he was there. Um, Commodore flew him over for it. Um, I love how, how we discover how desperately Commodore actually needed his work and how the Amiga, while they had the hardware, they were working on this alternative called Chaos, which is a great name for an operating system. But it was more than a year out from actually working, and it would have probably delayed the Amiga from being um, competitive at all if it had been delayed for another year. So he really saved them. And it's just brilliant to think that there's this guy who was based in um, based down in Devon in the southwest of England, and he was the man that made the Amiga work he was just mm. as important as any of the hardware, the work that he did to, to make it switch on uh, and the cheer he got from the team when he went over to America and showed them that their baby could actually do something useful and have windows on the screen and all of the rest of it. Um, he did that. And it's nice to know that that little part of Amiga history happened in deepest, darkest Devon with a, you know, probably a glass of cider on the table. <laughs> I like that. I really like that. Cider, secret ingredient to all our success. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, cool. Well, I look, I know, I know it's not a, what this video is actually about, but do you have any memories of using CLI and Workbench and anything like that on the Amiga, Neil? I Workbench a lot. I very rarely had to dip into the CLI, and that's probably because I had a basic unexpanded A500, so I was never having to muck mm. around much with, um, you know, boot priorities and, and drivers and all the rest, whatever else you need to do in CLI. Um, you know, I had no disk um to navigate other than the floppy that was in the drive at the time to muck around on so um no yeah. workbench was um there were the rare occasional game that you needed to go into workbench to launch uh, there was the say program when you wanted to make it swear um and have some fun <laughs> with that <laughs> um yeah oh and also another thing that's touched on in the interview is a fun story about how dr king 
didn't think he'd got the Amiga working, but in fact he had. It's just that the 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 way the the colors worked on the Amiga, um, the text that he was hoping would appear on the screen was in fact invisible. <laughs> um, yeah. And if you know anything about Workbench uh, and the garish colors of certainly the earlier versions of Workbench, um, it's all part and parcel of that story because the um, the blues and the the, the crazy bright colors on earlier workbenches were made so that it would be more visible on cheap televisions to bring the overall Mm. cost of the system down. Um, And there's just a a nice little tidbit in the interview where he talks about this, this silliness of of the text being completely invisible. And he had to turn the lights off to to prove that it was there. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, it's a really good interview. I'm glad it's not just me that didn't really delve, but I was the same. I had a stock Amiga 500, um, so I've only recently had to use the CLI for getting my A500 to talk to my PC in the last couple of years using Amiga Explorer and stuff like that. It's really my own exposure to it. That'll change because I've got I'm going to get a new hard drive for the A1200 and set that up from scratch. So I think I'm going to have to get my head around a lot more than I've needed to in the past. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's cool. So yeah, going back to this video, do check out the video from the Digital Orphanage and sincere thanks uh, not only to Dr. and Mrs. King for their work in making one of the most iconic computers in our lifetime work at all, but also to Keith for this exceptionally important archiving of yet another piece of Amiga history. So we will round off today's show with our community question of the week, as we always do. And the question from last week was, what was your first experience of MAME, the multiple arcade machine emulator? What was your favorite experience with it? Did you build a cabinet or set up around it purely for your arcade enjoyment? Did you have any pics of it that you'd like to share? Do you have any tips for Chris for his future build, which he's talking about doing? Is there a go-to game that you use to test out any new version of MAME? Tell us all about your love of MAME. So, um, Chris, do you want to read out our uh, top answer on the subreddit? Sure. Um, so this is by Burner Axis, I think, maybe, another mispronounced name, um, who says that he first met MAME while attending university in the mid-2000s, um, and he'd already been familiar with some console emulators, but this was the first time he'd encountered an arcade emulator, uh, which was really great because uh, he hadn't seen um, other than a handful of arcade machines in real life and managed to try them for the first time through MAME, but uh, his PC at the time wasn't really fast enough to run them properly. It's quite a long answer, which is why I'm sort of summarizing. So do visit the subreddit and the question of the week, uh, last week's question of the week, to have a read through because it is quite good. But essentially, he manages to, from what we gather, um, scrap together uh, an arcade MAME uh, cabinet from a disused wardrobe, some bits of sticky tape, and <laughs> God knows what else. Um, so, yeah. Yep, he's, he, and he, he summarizes at the end that saying he's still very, uh, it's still a very old PC, um, uh, has a very hard time with 3D stuff, uh, but it's more of a conversational piece. So great job to chop up an existing piece of furniture and actually turn it into a working MAME arcade cabinet. Neil, do you want to go on to the next one? Yeah, and I think he said, he mentions that he does it all for the princely sum of twenty pounds, which is bad going. Um, nice, but I really hope that he's called it the. Narcadia, if he hasn't called it that, <laughs> step into Narcadia. Um, yeah, I'll move on swiftly. Uh, the next answer <laughs> is from uh, Lunashi89. Says my first experience with Mame was back in 2001 when I found out that my local arcade, which had been going for some years, was finally closing its doors. So I started looking for a way to possibly emulate the arcade games. Since I was already familiar with emulation for other systems, that's when I found MAME, and I've been using it ever since. I love it. I even built my own MAME cabinet a few years ago. There's a link there. I'm going to click on the link to my own MAME cabinet, and there's a picture there. Oh, it's a a beast. Um, It's called Commander Reef's Arcade. No, Commander Beef. (laughs) Commander Beef's Arcade um, in the marquee. Nice big screen, huge control panel, huge two-player control panel, six buttons each. A um, couple of chairs to pull up. And then to the right of it is what looks like a virtual pinball machine they've built as well. So um, no, a I've real nice. As well, Neil. Yeah, nice gorgeous. looking room. Neon sign above it that says back to the arcade in kind of a back to the future style. I want to be in that room. I want to play some games on that. So um, nice build. Um, you got me thinking as well, all this meme chat as well. Uh, um, Lunashi is talking about their arcade closing its doors. So they had to find a way to carry on playing these games. 
But there must be a lot of regions around the world who didn't have the luxury that we had of going down to the seaside arcades, mm. enjoying all the latest and greatest games as they came out. Um, maybe even never set foot in an, in an arcade. And of course, the newer, younger generation who never got to experience arcades in their heyday. MAME is the window into that world. Um, so, uh, but particularly for people of our generation who perhaps only ever saw arcades in the pictures, it must be it must be quite wonderful to be able to fire up MAME and go, well, so this, this was what it was all about. This is what those games were like. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm wistfully staring off into the distance now thinking about that. Um, <laughs> let's, have the, I, yeah. the, let's have the third answer, Chris. Yeah. Well, before we do, you know, I mean, it was just a special time there, Neil, because, I mean, even though they were arcade home ports, they never played as well as the arcade. So the whole challenge was how can you play the arcade game at home? And, of course, all these years later, MAME is the answer to that question mm -hmm. because it's ex exactly the same version. It's fantastic. Anyway, so, yes, the last answer this week, routine ad 8055. Thank you for having an easy-to-pronounce name. I have been using MAME since around 2000-ish. I wanted to play Galaga, Galaxian, Gyrus. Pac-Man and many more arcade games. I had all the ROMs and used, oh, what the hell is that? CLR Main Pro. That's what Dave was talking about oh. last week. It was um, a okay. utility. What it would do is it would scan your uh, folder full of ROMs <clears throat> and then it would highlight any that you were missing for a complete ROM set. So you would then oh. go off and download those. So it was a really useful utility. Ah, oh, cool. Okay. Um, so you used that, used that to make up, uh, to make sure it was up to date, which makes sense to, with regards to what you just said. Um, I also used to produce the DAT file add-on packets for cabinets, flyers, and such like. So happy birthday, MAME, and have a good one from me. Yeah, so that's some really good MAME memories there. Nice one. Um, yeah, the add-on packs were really useful. If you had a front end, so you wanted the posters and the and the marquees and things to appear as you were scrolling through the games list. Um, to like the yeah. box. Yeah. Um, yeah. You mentioned okay. just before we came on to that answer uh, about home ports. Uh, and how now you can enjoy the authentic arcade experience through emulation. Um, it kind of becomes a bit of a problem sometimes when you're exploring old systems. So, for example, you might be on the Atari ST scrolling through a list of games to play. And where in the past I would have gone, oh, it's got OutRun, I'm going to play that. Um, or, oh, it's got, um, I don't know, Grizor, I want to play that. Um, now my instinct is, well, I can play the arcade version, so what's the point of trying the home port a lot of the time? Oh, um, yeah. You kind of, mm. I kind of skip over them now, which annoy, which mm. annoys me. I get angry at myself for not giving some of those games a chance. Uh, mm. But ultimately, those games all tried to be as good as the arcade. That was the point of them to be as good an arcade port as possible. And I kind of go, well, I'll just, I'll just play the arcade. I don't know. Yeah. Slap, my, no, slap back my hand, Chris. I should, I should give them more of a chance. Anyway, <laughs> let's not end the show on a downer, Chris. No, let's not. Let's move on to the new question of the week. Do you want me to read it out? Yes, please. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> okay, so question of the week. Have you created a low-level disk operating system and which chipset was it for? No, we're joking. <laughs> That's not the question of the week at all. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the question is, so I just... Yeah, nobody's going <laughs> to... Dr. Dr. King will... Be Dr. The, King has the entered the room, to yes. Yes, that's right. So the real question of the week is, did you aspire to be a game developer? How far did you get? Did you play with things like shoot 'em up construction kit or or even Amos? Or did you hard code to the metal? Have you published a game? Is it too late for Neil and myself? And what tips, either from a point of success or failure, would you pass on to the current generation of wannabe games developers? So good question. Yep, head over to the subreddit and give us your input. Yeah, good question, Chris. I'm I'm looking forward to hearing the answers on that. Um and I hopefully Hopefully it's not too late for us, Chris. <laughs> no, we just need to, well, I was about to say quit our jobs, but um, <laughs> <laughs> damn you. <laughs> <laughs> This Week in Retro was presented by Neil Thomas from RNC The Cave and Chris Winter from 005 Agima. It was produced by me, Duncan Styles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favourite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash thisweekinretro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, 
please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you enjoy our show and would like to support it, then please check out the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or description. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.